So first of all, Sergey, would you like to stand up and introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Sergey Nazarov. I'm uh, the CEO of SmartContract.com. What we do is allow existing financial infrastructure to connect and interact with next generation infrastructure like smart contract networks, Bitcoin, Ethereum, other networks. So the goal of our company is allowing you to take your existing infrastructure and use it to interact with these new smart contract networks and the new smart contract securities that we're all so excited about. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. I hope you guys are doing well out there. In this video, I'm gonna give you guys a comprehensive review on Chainlink. It's going to be clear, it's going to be concise, and it's gonna be right to the point. And if at any time you wanted to jump around to the more relevant parts of the video, make certain you guys use the timestamp in the description below. Somewhere along the video, I'm gonna give you guys a bonus clip of me doing a price analysis, showing you guys the areas where I'll be buying even more link tokens. If at any time you find yourself lost in the video, or perhaps you just prefer a written format. If that's the case, make sure you guys check out the link in the description below. I did a deep dive into the Chainlink project and I published an article on Medium. Also, I recently started sending out these weekly newsletters. So if you're interested in the following topics, make sure you guys click the link in the description below. Once you get to this page, simply enter your email address at the bottom of the page. And I'll make certain that every Sunday you guys get delivered a newsletter directly to your mailbox. And here's the newsletter that I sent out this past Sunday. It was the first edition of my weekly newsletter. And you can see here, I include a wide variety of topics, interviews, rate changes. I even provide tools for you guys that are updated on a weekly basis so you guys can track the interest rates across multiple platforms. If you're interested in something like this, again, make sure you guys click the link in the description below and you'll get a copy of this newsletter every Sunday. And before I begin the video, if you guys find yourself enjoying the content, make sure you guys subscribe, make sure to click that notification bell and help me expand my reach by smacking that like button. If you like the format of this video and you wanna see other tokens reviewed in the same format, make sure you express that opinion in the comment section below. I'd love to hear about the other projects you guys are interested in. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into this video. To begin the video, let's go ahead and talk about what Chainlink is and what their core objective is in the long run. To simply put it, Chainlink is the bridge between blockchain and the rest of the world. Essentially, what it's gonna allow blockchain-based companies and platforms to do it's going to allow them to connect to external APIs. Currently, a lot of these blockchain-based companies, they rely on centralized oracles to retrieve data and port it over on-chain. Link is looking to provide a decentralized oracle network that's going to enable smart contracts on-chain to interact with data that's off-chain. Here's the CEO himself describing one application of this technology. Sure, Kevin. So the, the goal of our proof of concept is to allow smart contracts to interact with data from outside the network and then allow the smart contract to also issue a payment on existing financial infrastructure. So the first thing that's going to happen is that interest rates for multiple banks are going to be given to a smart contract to generate a LIBOR average rate. That LIBOR average will have been computed by the smart contract in a provable, verifiable, trustworthy way with the data being given to it by something called a smart oracle. The interest rate computed by that average LIBOR smart contract will then be used by an actual smart contract security in the form of a smart bond. The LIBOR average interest rate will be used by the smart bond to calculate a coupon payment, which it will then send, which it, which it will then use to generate a payments message over the SWIFT network. So the, the goal is really to get valuable external data into a smart contract, allow it to perform its proper operations as a security, and then allow it to pay using the infrastructure that everybody already runs on, specifically in the form of uh, the SWIFT network with, with a payments message coming from that um, next generation security is, is the focus of, of what we're, uh, we're working on. Given that he's working with SWIFT, it's just natural for them to first focus on banking applications. But in the long run, this technology, this middleware, could also be applied to other industries like market data, retail payments, events data, web APIs. 
And to a certain degree, you're already seeing adoption, especially in the DeFi world. Now we're gonna go ahead and look under the hood and I'm gonna go over the architecture of the platform. This is the white paper, and this is basically a gross simplification of how the Chainlink network operates. To begin with, you have a user who makes the request. That request is screened by the user SC contract. Once the user request is accepted by the contract, it gets then pushed forward to the Oracle contract. To simply put it, this contract is designed to find the appropriate Oracle this process involves checking the trustworthiness, the credibility, the reputation of the Oracle. This way, in theory, the appropriate Oracle will be used to retrieve the data. Once the Oracles are chosen, the request gets sent to them. These Oracles then get data from multiple external APIs and they return that data to the Oracle contract. The data there gets aggregated and eventually makes its way back to the user who made the initial request. Now the steps I just outlined occur on chain, meaning they occur on the blockchain. The request is made by the user. The Oracle curation takes place on chain before the request gets sent out. Once the request is sent out, a chain link node will accept the request and route it to an adapter. The adapter then sends a request to the external API the adapter accepts the request from the external API and returns it to the core. The core then reports the data back onto the blockchain. The data here is aggregated and then returned to the user. Now that you guys know what the steps are on chain and off chain, let's take a look at what the advantages are in a system like this. The two main objectives are to provide reliable and secure data transmission in a decentralized manner. The Chainlink team plans to achieve this in three ways. Number one, they're gonna distribute data sources, the APIs. Number two, they're gonna have distributed oracles, the nodes that you see here. And lastly, they're gonna use trusted hardware. The trusted hardware approach isn't gonna be implemented anytime soon, but it's basically a extra layer of software that helps to securitize the network. But let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into the first two methods that I mentioned which involve distributing data sources and oracles. When you have distributed data sources, meaning APIs, you're gonna basically have redundant inflow of information. So essentially this will lead to data being transmitted more than once to multiple nodes. Redundancy may seem like a bad thing, but in the context of data curation, it's actually a good thing because if you get the same data inputs from multiple sources, you could implement a voting mechanism that only allows data to be pushed on chain if it gets a majority of the vote. For example, if you have all these four data sources return back an answer, and let's say three out of the four data sources return A, but one of the data sources return B, if we use a simple majority voting model, A would get selected and be pushed on chain. This basically reduces the chances of bad data making its way on chain. Secondly, the network requires multiple chain link nodes, which are basically oracles. And let's say one of these nodes gets compromised, the system can still remain intact because you have other nodes that could pick up the slack. And this serves to remove the single point of failure that a lot of Oracle systems have. Because if you have one monolithic Oracle and it gets compromised, it could bring your entire platform to a grinding halt. And for that reason, I think it also adds resiliency to the overall network. And the many platforms that choose to integrate with the Chainlink network. If you guys follow my channel, you guys know that I look at token utility in a very serious way. If you're interested in getting a glimpse into the future and seeing what the utility model will look like, I have this extensive write-up that I've published on Medium. So if you're interested in getting an expanded view of the utility model and what's to come, make sure you guys check out this article by clicking the link in the description below. After reading the white paper and looking at resources online, it becomes abundantly clear that the Chainlink team has thought very deeply about tokenomics. So much so that they've actually mandated the use of the Link token on their network. To begin with, Chainlink operators will need to be paid for the service that they render. Not only are they retrieving data from APIs, but they're formatting that data, they're doing off-chain computations, also, there's uptime maintenance costs associated with running a node. 
So the user that makes the request has to pay these node operators with the link token. Secondly, to run a link node, you have to put up collateral. And the reason why nodes have to put up collateral is because if they fail in retrieving that data, or if they send back data that's faulty, or maybe they just take too long because they're doing a poor job of maintaining their node, all of these actions could result in penalty, meaning the node operator would have to pay the user requesting the data. And this money would basically come out of all the collateral that they put up with link tokens. In theory, the value of the collateral locked in the node would have to be equal to or exceed the value of the smart contract. Let's say there's a large transaction valued in the billions. Let's say it's worth $5 billion. If something happens between the data transmission leading to the loss of the $5 billion, the node operators would be obligated to pay back that $5 billion using the money that's been collateralized to the party that initiated that smart contract transaction. Also, it's a means for data set providers to monetize their data. By starting their own node, they could actually produce additional revenue streams for their business. In my view, this is a great idea because it's actually going to incentivize a lot of enterprises to get more involved in the Chainlink network. And as more enterprises get onboarded, they're actually going to bring more value to the network because number one, they'll actually have to buy Chainlink tokens to collateralize their nodes. Secondly, they're bringing their data sets, which is basically adding to the overall inventory of data sets on the network. In addition to the notable partnerships with Google and Swift, you also have a lot of DeFi projects that are deciding to partner with Chainlink. Almost every day I hear an announcement about a new project collaborating with Chainlink. In my eyes, these aren't really partnerships. Again, they're more like collaborations. And because of the nascency, because this network is new, a lot of people have to be onboarded. They have to be guided. And the Chainlink team probably has to work closely with these other teams to make sure that they troubleshoot any issues that arise. Ultimately, I envision a future where people just opt in to use Chainlink. They don't have to get formalized authorization from the network. I expect maybe SDKs to be developed. At some point, the Chainlink network is going to be resilient enough to accept any platform that's looking to integrate into their network. And since the primary concern with a lot of these DeFi platforms is front running, they're worried about their oracles becoming compromised. Chainlink's decentralized oracle system offers an easy solution to the large problem that they have. And I've been saying this for quite some time. I think eventually Chainlink network is going to become a industry standard. You'll see every single DeFi platform opt into the Chainlink Oracle network. But it's not just DeFi, HDAC, which is a blockchain technology company started by one of the family members of the Hyundai family. They're working on IoT technology and with Chainlink, they'll be able to source external data for computational use inside their blockchain. One interesting partnership was a partnership between Chainlink and Bloom. Bloom is doing something very unique. They're actually going to create a bridge with Chainlink so that way they can integrate traditional credit bureau data with decentralized finance platforms. Part of the reason why the growth in the lending market on DeFi platforms isn't growing much or is limited is because unless the user over collateralizes a loan, there's no really good mechanism in place to make sure that the person borrowing the loan, let's say on no collateralization, will pay it back. And if they require users to give their credit data, that would actually compromise the anonymity of the user. And Bloom is actually working with Chainlink so they could extract anonymized credit worthiness data off chain associated with the Ethereum address. And by doing so, the DeFi platform could determine the credit worthiness of a particular user on their DeFi platform without having the user giving up any of their personal data. And this is gonna to serve to expand the DeFi lending market because it'll allow for a more efficient capital allocation based on lower or no collateralization. And if you're interested in learning about more partnerships, again, make sure you check out that article I wrote on Medium by clicking in the description below. 
Now, before I talk about the investment prospects of the token, my investment thesis, I quickly wanted to go over where I'm looking to buy heavy amounts of link. But in addition to my heavy buy, I also buy link on a weekly basis. I actually stopped buying Bitcoin weekly and switched it over to link back in December. So right when the price was in this range on a weekly basis, ever since this month, I've been dollar cost averaging into link. Now, let me explain why I hold an optimistic view on the token. Number one, the utility model for this token is very strong. The economic incentives for people to start nodes, to buy link, to collateralize link is very compelling in my opinion. To incentivize these legacy institutions out there to participate in the ecosystem, you have to provide very robust incentives. Every actor out there is acting in self-interest and to encourage these actors to participate in the ecosystem and add value to it, you have to offer them something in return. And this platform does that by offering them a method to monetize their data sets to create an additional revenue stream for their business. Also, by linking on-chain platforms to off-chain data, this is going to create a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs. Chainlink, in my opinion, could be the catalyst for business and job creation. And these entrepreneurs will be creating the bridge that helps the world and the legacy system transition into a digital blockchain-based economy. Also, it's gonna create a means for a lot of these blockchain-based companies to collect data that they need to offer a wide variety of services. This will free up time and resource for them to focus on their core business. For example, take Uber. Uber actually used APIs to accelerate their development because by leveraging APIs, they could access Google Maps and they could access Stripe for payments. Rather than coming up with their own GPS system, rather than coming up with their own payment system, they could actually focus on the ride sharing portion of the application. If it wasn't for API, it would have taken a lot longer for Uber to come out with their product. The same way APIs help Uber speed up their development, it'll also help blockchain-based companies accelerate their development. In my eyes, I see Chainlink middleware as a Trojan horse. It's basically linking the legacy world with the digital asset industry. Think about it, if a smart contract on chain could initiate a payment transfer or a payment in the legacy network from bank to bank, What's stopping a smart contract from initiating a transfer from, let's say, a bank onto a DeFi platform? This interoperability that's being built out is going to allow for money off-chain to be securely and reliably transferred on-chain. Once the risk is removed, you're going to see more people in the legacy system, more actors in the legacy system interact with blockchain based platforms. In my opinion, this could bring a tremendous amount of liquidity into the digital asset industry. Lastly, Link is being listed on almost every exchange. It's kind of reminiscent of what I witnessed with ETH back in 2016 to 2017. I mean, you have exchanges like Gemini, which don't host too many tokens, also go ahead and list Link. And in my opinion, these exchanges are listing the token number one because it's in high demand. So they'll make money off of exchange fees. And I don't have a way to prove this, but I also think these guys have insider information and they expect the token to do really well in the coming years. And the cherry on top is that MakerDAO has expressed interest in adding Link tokens as a form of collateral to their platform. And if that takes off in a big way, that's more link tokens that are going to be removed from the circulating supply and locked up. So for all those reasons, I've decided that link is going to be part of my long term holdings. And again, I plan to continue to dollar cost average into link tokens. Now, to end the video, I just wanted to say that with all the turmoil in the legacy markets, I think the digital asset industry is well poised to replace the existing market infrastructure. Part of the reason why Bitcoin, Ethereum and all these platforms exist today is because a lot of people saw what was wrong with the existing infrastructure. We saw that it was crumbling. It was unfair. It wasn't very democratized. In fact, it's the exact opposite. To even participate in the system, you have to have access to banking. So a lot of people were left out and the people that were able to participate are constantly being screwed over. You're seeing the replacement of the system being built as we speak. 
And in my view, this new digital architecture will be supported with three pillars. Number one, sound money. You have Bitcoin. Secondly, you have smart contracts with Ethereum. And lastly, you have decentralized middleware with Link. And as people begin to lose trust in the legacy markets and it starts to endanger their life savings, they're going to be looking for alternatives. And until the inception of Chainlink, I don't think that infrastructure in the digital asset market was ready for influx of users and the wealth transfer between the legacy system and the new digital asset system. Plus, there wasn't a really safe and efficient way of transferring wealth from the legacy markets into the new digital asset market. And I think we found the missing link. We found the missing component that's going to help facilitate this massive transition. And at the end of the video, I'm going to show you guys a clip of the CEO telling all the people at this Swift event in a very subtle way to buy Bitcoin. But before I play the clip, I just wanted to ask you guys again to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel if you guys enjoy the content, and don't forget to sign up for my free newsletter by clicking the link in the description below. With that being said, this is Crypto One Stop signing out. Sergey, one final piece of advice you'd like to impart on everybody? Yeah, I, I think the real decision corporate folks have is this is about is this a sustaining innovation or is this a disruptive innovation? So is it going to allow you to maintain competitiveness in the status quo by maintaining your systems or is it something that's going to disrupt and change the way you're forced to do business? In, in either case, I think a sound investment is getting your systems ready and cryptographically connected to these networks like Ethereum, Bitcoin, other other networks where these smart securities and other things which will either be sustaining or disruptive will, will be happening. What, what you folks don't want is for something to start happening in those networks and for you not to be able to get on them in a, in a timely, secure manner. That's the scenario I think folks would, would do well to avoid.